My name is Shirley Flores Munoz. I'm on the Education Committee of the Pajaro Valley Gallery. Uh, Gabe Medina and I organized this event. Um, we were kind of disappointed that the doors have been shut at the museum because of the pandemic. Um, and we wanted to have a way to share the art with the community. So this evening is our effort to do that. But Gabe will talk about other things that he is in the process of doing as well. Um, thank you for being here tonight, for joining us. Um, this is a very important show. Um, it, it did not, it was not planned to come out in the middle of a pandemic, but it did. And I have to say that uh, as a result of that, um, this show is to show the appreciation that we have, the celebrate the uh, contributions that campesinos make, and to make a, a statement of recognition of the contributions that they are making to the country as essential workers. Uh, in the Pajaro Valley, we have a long history of agricultural workers who come from a variety of ethnic and historic moments. Uh, we've had Filipino workers, Croatian, Native American, Mexicano, Chicanos, Japanese, Chinese workers, and Dust Bowl refugees. All of them have come in a very unique moment through history from 1830 to the present. And they have confronted rigor, they have confronted soil, they've confronted drought, they've confronted um, the creation of an agribusiness that has built the Pajaro Valley uh, and made us very strong economically. Um, but we have also faced discrimination. Various groups came at different times and we faced anti-Chinese legislation and immigration rulings. We faced the gentleman's agreement with the Japanese American community. The Japanese also faced internment during World War II. The Mexican community has had to deal with the Bracero program during World War II, which was supposed to last during World War II, but actually lasted until 1964. Therefore, uh, barring the ability for farm workers to uh, organize into unions. Uh, unions throughout the United States were very um, successful and farm workers were the very last group to be able to be organized until not, uh, which we started under the United Farm Worker Movement um, and that took place um, uh, in the 1970s. Um, in the strength that was that we had the Agriculture Labor's Relation Act and the California Agriculture Relation, Re Relation Act that there bar, gar, uh, guaranteed the right for workers to uh, elect to have a union, to organize on the fields, and to stop facing pesticide abuse and uh, other kinds of things that are unhealthy for farm workers. So it has this, this, this area of work, agriculture work, has also been a home of a lot of conflict between b different groups. Um, but today we're gonna celebrate something else that's very important. And I think we need to say it out loud that campesinos today are feeding the world. I know that you have probably seen different stories throughout the United States where milk was thrown away because there was no one to bottle it and package it. Um, potatoes were turned under. But in the Pajaro Valley United, uh, Pajaro Valley Gallery, Campesinos from day one have not moved into shelter in place, have been in the fields working side by side, uh, harvesting. Uh, crops, uh, planting crops, uh, thinning crops, irrigating crops, and making sure that those crops are now harvested and shipped all over the country. So people are being able to eat fresh vegetables, fresh fruit, as a result of the essential labor of campesinos. And for that, the pandemic has shown us that point. That was always the experience 
always the contribution, but we have never been in a pandemic before where it has been pointed out, made very clear. And so tonight we're going to have poets who are going to make commentary and also read their beautiful words. We are going to have Ruby Vasquez and Rosa Hernandez talk about the Watsonville Campesino Appreciation Caravan. Um, and also we're going to have um, Janet Johns and uh, um, uh, Rosa Hernandez talk about dancing in shelter because uh, today's campesino brings with them to our community, labor, strength, community, family, and essential work values. And they also bring with them culture. Um, and I have to remind us all, la cultura cura. There are aspects within our culture, music, dance, tradition, poetry, art, that will cure us. And today, the word cure also has a very, very spectacular and particular significance. We are in the middle of a pandemic. There is no one on the face of this earth today who can escape this pandemic. And in a sense, it has united us in our awareness that we share the world together. And um, our children are also realizing that the environment is very important. We have to take care of the environment. So the environment will also take care of us. So my grandchildren who are now 14 and 13 have been home from school since March, have not been out of the home, have had to wash their hands and wear a mask they are going to be like my friend Gabriela, my comadre told me, she said that this pandemic is going to have a large impact on our youth in terms of environmental consciousness. And I think that I see that happening. So um, thank you so much for joining us. And uh, Gabe, did you have anything that you would want to say before we start? Hey, no, just um, welcome everybody and thank you for being here with us today. Um, I know when we were um, getting this exhibit together with Consuelo Alba from the Watsonville Film Festival, we really wanted to put a big emphasis on um, getting a lot of local artists um, to come and submit their work and really just start um, a movement to really acknowledge our campesinos, um, not only through art, but we're seeing it, um, it kind of expand out into media, into the outside, like with the campesino caravan that um, Ruby is currently um, doing right now for our community, going around to the different campesinos. So we felt that this exhibit um, was necessary and needed in order to highlight the great work that is being done. Um, the hard work, I would say, being done by our campesinos. Um, when Consuelo and I were looking at all these different submissions, it was, we wanted to bring in everybody, but the downside is having wall space. So, um, you know, now that it's virtual, we're hoping to incorporate a lot more pieces and a lot more people's visions um, about how they see our campesinos. Um, many of us are connected to the campesinos. I know personally, my grandma um, was working in the fields for about 60 years and um, and just seeing her work and tend to, um, you know, the earth was um, a really great experience for me. And it really brought me to my roots. Um, and, um, you know, when I went off to UCLA and I would always talk about Watsonville, our strawberries, every time I'd go to a subway and see Driscoll's, I tell people that's where my hometown is right there. So um, it was just great to see local artists and just artists from, um, I would say all through California submit their pieces to really show that they really care for the campesinos and to really just capture the hard work that they do. Um, a lot of the pieces that you were seeing earlier shows that out in the sun, outside, by themselves, picking. And, um, you know, it was um, really good to put on this exhibit. Um, you know, this originally was supposed to be paired with um, the Watsonville Film Festival um, back in March. So um, it's it's crazy. We're in a pandemic right now. Um, we opened the gallery for a brief moment, but then we got the marching orders to shut it down again. Um, and a little bit later on, I'll go ahead and discuss a really cool um, project that I'm working on to give you guys more insight to the gallery. And um, that's it for me, Shirley. Thank you. Okay. Um, Consuelo, would you have a minute? Did, did you want to make a contribution? Consuelo was the... Um... Uh, she worked very heavily on the selection of the art. Did you have a comment to make, Consuelo? Consuelo um, Alba? Oh, there you are. Did you have a comment to make or no? 
Well, just to thank everyone for putting this event together despite all the challenges of this exhibit because it was right when the pandemic started. I'm so proud that um, you know we are putting it out there through the virtual tour. Now we have this wonderful event, Una Noche Bohemia con Poesia, Musica, Danza, and everything is to honor our local campesinos and everybody out there doing working the land so we can um, be fed and, and take care of our families. Thank you so much to everyone making this happen. And yeah, you guys um, said everything we needed to say. It, the exhibit is amazing. And Gabe is also working on a video and more information on the background of, about how this exhibit started, the inspiration behind it, and different artists who are part of it. So very excited to be part of this program. Thank you. All right. So we are going to now start with our poetry. Um, I'll introduce the first poet, um, Naomi Quinones. Uh, Naomi Elena Quinones is a poet, educator, and activist. She's the author of three collections of poetry, Hummingbird Dreams, Sueño de Colibri, The Smoking Mirror, and Exiled Moon. She edited several critical and literary publications, including Invocation LA, Urban Multicultural Poetry, which won the American Book Award, Decolonial Voices and Caminos Magazines. She offers New Moon writing workshops for Bay Area women of color. She holds a PhD in American history and contributes to the scholarship of Latinos and women of color. She is a recipient of the Berkeley Lifetime Achievement Award, a Rockefeller Fellowship, the American Book Award, and a California Arts Grant. Thank you for joining and being with us, Naomi. Thank you. I am just getting myself together here to see if, um, are you seeing me? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right there, yeah. Naomi, we see okay. you. If, uh, first of all, everyone, if you want to mute yourself while our uh, speaker is uh, reading, if, I don't hear any noise from anybody, so that's fine. Uh, secondly, um, you can also go to the little tiny dots at the top, and you have an option of seeing everybody's picture or speaker view. And uh, you can do that. Uh, I just wanted to remind you um, that also we are taping, recording, because we're going to use this later. Well, what, what did, are you trying to tell me something, Naomi? No, that's okay. Oh, okay. Sure. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I'm, I'm really happy that uh, to have been invited. And I know Shirley, because I lived in Watsonville in the 70s where I was an activist and um, learned so much about that little, it's not a little town anymore. When, when I was there, it was, but it has a lot of power from the activism that has gone on there for many years, the strikes, um, the, uh, the campesino rights, um, the social services. So I, it, when I would live there, I wrote this poem called People of the Harvest. And I'm from Los Angeles originally. I'm in Oakland now. But in, in Los Angeles, I had no contact with how our food actually got to our table. Um, so it was really important for me to have the experience in Watsonville in so many ways. This, this is called People of the Harvest. The crushed grape withers on the vine. No gnarled hands to pick it, no one to make wine. Lettuce now lost wilts on its row, the empty fields forgotten by side, by sickle and hoe. Cotton worms slowly drying in the sun. If there were bats to carry it, but there are none. Fruit long past ripe falls heavy to the ground and bursts its rotting entrails with a sluggish sound. The fields are all in mourning, rotting blackly in their sorrow for the people of the harvest who will not return tomorrow. The grapevine now a grave mark for every back wrenched soul that spent a life of labor and died giving birth to growth. The poison that protects the field often kills the worker. The sun that ignites orchards to bloom beats hard upon the child and sucks life away. When the field has finished rotting and gives herself to bloom, be aware of the many souls in the orchards 
perfume, in the fine green skin of the plant, in the sweetness of the fruit, in the soil dark with my people's blood, in the fiber of the root. And I'm reading from my book, Sueño de Godipu. I write a lot about women in my, um, in my poetry. And the, this next one is called La Diosa and Every Woman, pretty much about how um, Chicanas, Latinas, Mexican origin women have been doing all the hard work for so many years. This is an altar of women, a woman's altar where the shy goddess speaks in voices more powerful than the laments of our mutilated histories where one mind opens like an eye against the stairs that have tried to turn us into stone. This is an altar, not a high pedestal or a political platform, but a foundation of the universe, a stage for our shadows to act their truths. This is an altar, unaltered by the war cries that have burdened each century with our own rude deaths. We place wreaths of sunflowers, wild poppies, and rosaries of corn upon our lips and, and kiss away <clears throat> each wounded moment that has sliced our heads in half until we have become twice as beautiful in both our passion and our rage. Who is that woman on the corner of Brooklyn and Soto streets? <clears throat> her battered vision has splintered her into a hundred pieces. She is Goyle Shauki dismembered goddess whose shattered parts once scattered the steps of the patriarchal pyramid. We recognize her as a new totality for our connecting visions. Gather us in your arms, Goyal Shauki, make us whole again. Guadalique is the braided hair that lies upon the head of a Guatemalan woman drinking a Pepsi in MacArthur Park. The power of life and death rests like water in her palms. The two-headed serpent of her soul holds her in two worlds that have split her mind into alternating waves of conflict and reconciliation. Heal us, Coatlicue. Become the bridge between the worlds that separate us from ourselves. Who is that woman crossing the border? She is Malina Chochitli, keeper and power of nature, warrior woman and warrior sister who does battle each day with the pompous winds that attack the very breath that survives inside the dreams of tired seamstresses. Gather us in your heart, Malina Chochitli. Give us courage for the battles ahead. Is that donut scene in stiletto heels with hips the size of Mother Earth? shaking to the drums of each fertile moment that gives birth to new consciousness. Dance with us, Donat Sin. Enfold us in your red and black robes. Bless the births we give to ourselves and each other. This is an altar of women, a woman's altar constructed for the goddess inside the heart of each woman and man. Come to us, Diosa. Work through us, Diosa, to heal the wounds of flesh and dreams, to plant the seeds of strength. This is an altar of women, a woman's altar, and here no woman will be sacrificed. The Western work ethic and the overworked ethnic. And I wrote this because I was so tired of hearing the myth of the lazy Mexican when, you know, we know that we're working all the time. I saw your eyes tumble out of your head under the weight of a sack of gold. The Spaniard had declared you a beast of burden and refused to acknowledge your skin and bones left to dry in mottled roads with only the teeth of dogs to redeem them. A century or so later, the church it took you a hundred years to build ripped the arms from your body and used them as flags to fly atop palacios de gobiernos that, that waved in bruised colors of broken fingers and sweating hands. Later in that century, I saw your swollen lungs expand sluggishly under a heavy layer of mind dust until they exploded and vanished in your, into your next life. 
were you reincarnated as a Chicano murdered by the makers of the short-handled hoe? Crushed between high suns and low wages, you were one more hard worker buried under the ground that had been taken from your ancestors. Today, I am witness to your pinprick fingers as they inch along endless rows of zippers. You have been sewing all your life in some poorly lit cell that is stealing your eyes. Piecework and peonage are stitched into the lining of your eyelids. Each decade and every century have been your labor camp where you have worked, worked, worked in varying states of slavery and manipulated cheap labor under an enforced work, work ethic that declares you lazy, shiftless people of manana, conniving welfare cheaters, and you continue to peel the fields for expanding stomachs, dig ditches for foundations, and piece together fabric for next year's fall fashions, while your own belly shrivels in humiliated nakedness as you prepare to dissolve one more time into the dust that will cover you with the fruitlessness of your labor. And I'd like to end with this poem um, that I wrote especially for, for tonight. Um, I had been aware that there is a lot of sexual assault in the fields of um, Watsonville, probably you know, in, in many fields, but Watsonville um, came to light as a result of the women who um, have been demanding justice and dignity. So this is for the women who have been experiencing that because many of us know that also the journey from to El Norte also for women is very perilous and also uh, includes sexual assault. And this will be my last one. Campesinas. Luisa, Maria, Mireya y Luz, recen a la Virgen San Miguel y Jesús. México, vacío de sueños y trabajo, te obligó a una vida de ser los de abajo. Sin pan, sin futuro, escuchan la canción de los campos de California con mucho desesperación. El camino de tristeza fue peligroso. Mother or grandmother, single or wed, your men clutch your throats, a fist to your head, a rupture, a wound, a stealing of soul. Llegaron cansadas de ser abusadas. Luisa, Maria, Mireya y Luz, recen a la Virgen, San Miguel y Jesús. México vacío de sueños y trabajo te obligó a una vida de ser los de abajo. En los files trabajan duro, igual que los hombres. Piscan y sudan para un mejor, mejor futuro. But you are not men. You are women who face a system of patriarchy where men dominate. As you work in the fields, they feel they can take you and have their way with you, trapping you, raping, and subjugating you. The fields are a crime scene for sexual assault. Your tears and your misery are not your fault. Pero el poder de la mujer es más fuerte cuando se juntan para exigir la justicia y reclamar sus derechos, sus voces y sus vidas. Campesinas, su valor nos inspira. Basta ya con las violaciones y con los hombres brutos y despiadados. Transcend the cruelty, call out the pain, and never let a man violate you or another woman again. Luisa, Maria, Mireya, y Luz, recen a la Virgen, San Miguel y Jesús. Sus sueños vive y están realizados en los derechos de la mujer están obligados. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naomi. That was beautiful. Um, if people have comments or questions, you can put it in the chat box and we will look at it and address them at the end. 
Um, our next presenter is Ruby Vasquez and Rosa Hernandez, who are working in Watsonville with the Watsonville Campesino Appreciation Caravan. So let's see that next. Okay, thank you, Ruby. Muy buenas tardes. I don't hear Ruby yet. Can you I'm, all hear me? This is Rosa. Hi, Ruby. I'm here, but I, oh, there I am. All righty. So can you see, can you see the? Yes, we can. Okay, and then I need Coming in great. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, thanks Rosa for jumping in there. Um, yeah, no problem. So I'm Ruby Vasquez, born and raised in Watsonville. Um, uh, educator in Pajaro Valley Unified School District for about 30 years. Still working there as a parent educator, a parent education trainer. Um, I've been active in the community for many, many years in different capacities. And I'm also a folklorico dancer with Esperanza del Valle. And I'm here tonight with my comadre Rosa Hernandez, and we're going to be talking about um, the Watsonville Campesino Appreciation Caravan. And at first, we really just want to um, show the images that we have here. And um, let's see, uh, Gabe, I'm trying to push the arrow, but it's not moving it. Um, Oh, wait a minute. Okay, I'm gonna to have to roll it because it's not letting me push the arrow. Um, so, you know, we wanted to start off with the images and just really truly, um, you know, recognize the uh, campesinos and the campesinas who are out there working. Um, we started doing the caravan in April, as you can see on the tweet, that this was, I think, our, our first uh, caravan that we went out. And um, this got tweeted by someone and it, and, it, and it, you know, got, look at how many likes it got. Immediately, people around the country um, were relating to this. I mean, they were seeing that the campesinos were out there working. And um, as, as, as many of us were, you know, having the privilege to uh, shelter in place. Um, our team consists of, of 30 people, um, 30 um, community members here in Watsonville, adults and youth. Our youngest is um, Mari Martinez. I believe she probably is like maybe a third grader now, but um, it really does, um, this, the effort of the caravana does take, uh, it, it's a huge effort and, and everybody plays an important role. Um, I, I especially want to give a shout out to Angela Martinez and Maria Martinez, who are our um, Misteco Bajo interpreters, who when they can, uh, they go with us so they can interpret um, to Misteco Bajo. Why did we start the caravan? We um, started the caravan uh, because we, as so many of us here on this, uh, at this Zoom uh, session, um, realized from day one that the campesinos were uh, left out of the general narrative of essential workers. And just as we saw in the past when there were the huge fires of North and South, uh, Southern California, the campesinos continued to work um, regardless of the health conditions. And once again, we were seeing this, that regardless of the health conditions, the expectation was that campesinos go out and work. And um, many of us, our parents, um, work the fields here in Watsonville. Some of us actually pick the fields, pick the strawberries, the raspberries here in Watsonville as our summer jobs, as our weekend jobs. So we know what it is to be out there and we know how essential this job is and how noble it is. Because of the, the work that my parents did out in the strawberries, you know, I was able to get my education. I was able to, I remember the voices of the senoras picking strawberry alongside me saying, you know, sigue estudiando, keep work, keep, keep studying. So our personal experiences, um, you know, really pushed us to, uh, to, to bring this caravana together. And, um, and you know, it, we came together on a Zoom, uh, a Zoom social uh, evening on a Friday night, 
uh, but it wasn't social. It really wasn't. It was a group of us, you know, talking about why is this happening? Like, why once again are, are the campesinos expected to be out there while we're here sheltering in place? And how can we thank them? How can we just let them know that we appreciate the work that they're doing? And Ramiro Medrano, one of our, uh, one of the people on our Zoom session, um, said, why don't we do a caravan? So that's how it started. It, it started um, with the, uh, with that idea of doing a caravan. And so that first Saturday, we, na we went out in April and um, we didn't know what we were doing, but we went out with our signs. We had a big, you know, a speaker and, and um, I'm, Rosa can talk about what, what it was that we were doing. You're on mute, Rosa. Disculpen, disculpen. Um, I'm Rosa. I'm also one of the organizers of the Caravana and also an educator here in Pajaro Valley. I'm the principal at Lakeview Middle and I'm really happy to be here with you guys. But the reason that, you know, we started going out was, or not the reason, but when we started going out, really our purpose was that we just wanted to demonstrate our appreciation. And initially you see the pictures throughout the PowerPoint and if you go into our website, or not our website, but our Instagram and our Facebook, you'll see images of, you know, from the very first caravana that we took until the recent one that we just did, I think, a day or two ago. Um, and you'll see that there's a group of, you know, those of us that come from, you know, this area live, from, live here in Watsonville, and our effort was to go and demonstrate our appreciation. And when we go out there's a variety of things that we have been doing in the beginning it was going out and showing our signs of appreciation all of our kids our family members created signs that said gracias campesinos you know campesinos are heroes in our communities a variety of different positive messaging and we would stand in front of the area where the field workers were at so that they could see us and eventually that grew into um actually recording messages in both in Spanish and in Misteco Bajo. And after we started doing that, we would play music as we would go into, or we play music when we go into the field um, and the music is playing and then they get to hear the message and they get to see us with our signs at least to demonstrate some form of appreciation. But that kind of evolved um, into thinking, what more can we do for campesinos? So you'll see in this picture here, that there is a variety of material, informational material that we've been able to get from different local agencies and resources um, in order to provide our local campesinos information. Um, for us, it was very critical to be able to provide information in regards to COVID and how to take care of yourself um, with the washing of the hands, with you know the um, wearing of the mask and the appropriate way of wearing a mask. Also the importance of the census and participation in census. So this packet is one example of some of the information that we started sharing with our community members, with the campesinos, and we package them in, you know, some bags and um, take them out to, to the campesinos. And that evolved into the next step, which is, I think, on the next slide, if I'm not mistaken. Um, yeah, so part of this was about creating relationship. So mm -hmm. as we would go and take the package of information to the mayordomos, we would get their name, we would introduce who we are, why we're doing this. And it was a really about creating a relationship so that, so that we can then enter with permission into the, um, into the work site. Mm -hmm. We were able to build some relationships and we're still working on that in a variety of different ways um, with, the, with the mayordomos, with the rancheros, and that has really opened up the doors. And as you can see, um, we have here in the in the top right hand picture Guillermina. If any of you are familiar with Salud para la Gente, Guillermina has been an educator there for many years. And she is now one of the individuals that goes out, provides some information. So we began to adopt a quadrilla and adopting a quadrilla involved a couple of different things. Um, during the adopting of a quadrilla, we would identify a quadrilla actually to go and visit. Um, and we figure out by talking to the mayordomo how many uh, campesinos are going to be there on a particular day. During the day that they allow us to go to their ranch, we provide an, uh, kind of like an information educational opportunity session. And that's why, 
you know, Guillermina, you see her there with the microphone. She provides information in regards to Salud para la Gente, COVID testing, um, different benefits and resources available through Salud para la Gente. Um, she's one of the individuals that goes out, but we also provide other information, as you can see from the packet that we had just, you know, demonstrated in that last picture. Um, we have also had an opportunity to get some funding and some support from um, Oscar Rios and his group from, is it Fiestas Patrias? Um, and is that correct, Ruby? Well, they put on the Fiestas Patrias uh, they, events. It's Grupo Alianza del Valle de Paz. Grupo Alianza. And they have been able, they have been very supportive and have provided funding also to help us to provide lunch for some of the cuadrillas. Um, you'll see if you go on Instagram, some of the pictures where we were able to take some tortas and Radio Lacev actually went out there and, you know, did a broadcasting live. Um, so we were able to do that. A lot of people have donated um, some books. So we've been able to take educational material and books for our, for the students or the, the, the children of the campesinos. Um, and we have also requested and, you know, gone in competition with each other in regards to fundraising, which actually started off, um, you know, between the, all of the organizers to see if we could at least you know, um, get some funding amongst our group and we were able to purchase some household products which you saw in that last picture. Ruby, you want to We also want to just really, you know, uh, just really thank every, all the, uh, the different community members and organizations and departments that have been supporting us by providing us with handouts to distribute. At the beginning, you know, we were making the copies and Digital Nest was so gracious mm -hmm. to let us use their facility to make copies. Now Watsonville City provides us with tons of copies about how to wear the masks properly, you know, um, uh, how to, as a family, how to enjoy time with your family and not be just, you know, encerrados, being enclosed all day long. The Santa Cruz uh, County Agricultural Commissioner's Office, Juan Hidalgo, has been also very gracious in making copies about Oh gosh, just different things of, of, of what the campesinos need to be um, aware of. This right here shows their card, uh, this pocket card that they created so that the campesino could just have it in their, in their pocket and, you know, be reminded of what are those symptoms? You know, what are the symptoms that they need to be watchful for? And then where can they go to, to uh, seek um, uh, help if needed? It's all on this little card. Um, as Rosa mentioned, we've partnered with Salud para la Gente, um, community organizations like Community Bridges, CAB, um, just so many uh, PVUSD, so many um, other uh, folks who are contributing in that way in this effort that we're trying to do to keep campesinos safe during this time because they don't have the luxury to shelter in place. Many of them don't have the insurance, you know, the medical insurance. Um, they don't have the pr privileges, as we know, that, um, we, that many of us have. So the resources are there. We always, we leave a packet of information and we just say, we know it's a lot of information, but please, when you're home and you're having some that, that quiet time, please just, you know, try to read through this. And, and information is power. And in the, in the resources that we're leaving, you know, we're hoping that they, are, they will um, access those resources that are available. This next picture is just very briefly before we go on to the next slide. Peek on the like far, uh, kind of towards the middle of the right side, you see Gabe. I'm pretty sure that's Gabe that was filming and recording. So as you can see, this whole campesino effort is a, a, a really a community effort. You, there's, this is a multitude of cars in this particular caravana when it was opened up to community members and Gabe did it favor of going out and recording and created these beautiful videos to share part of the story and this journey. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we shared that picture with everybody and we hope that you check out the videos. I think you put the links in the chat box and please definitely check them out on our, on our um, Instagram and Facebook. And in the a, next slide, Rosa, can sorry, I go ahead. real quick, um, as she yeah. mentioned, this was one of the first ones where we were um, bringing uh, community members to join the caravan, but when the numbers spiked, uh, we, we really thought about safety for everyone. So we have closed that opportunity. And, you know, some people are giving us a little hard time about that. But, you know, we are just really trying to keep everyone safe when, 
when we go out and we're distributing things, we always have our gloves on, we have our masks on, you know, we try as best as we can to do that social distancing. But as you know, those of you who work in the fields, trying to keep distant in those narrow rows and it's, it's difficult. So um, I just wanted to mention that because a lot of people have been asking if they could join. And right now, currently, we just have kept it closed to the planning group. This next slide um, speaks to our recent um, great accomplishment on behalf of the whole group. And, um, you know, as, as we shared with you, there are about 30 members and all of us have different connections and networks and people that we, you know, are supportive of our efforts. And one of our compañeras uh, helped us to actually get a fiscal sponsorship. So we're super happy that now we have Action Council of Monterey as a fiscal sponsor. And this allows us to be able to do more fundraising. That fundraising that we our own allowed us to purchase some household items because, you know, when everybody was out um, in shelter in place or we've all been out, but, you know, but people have been able to go to areas or, or to churches to pick up material um, or food or what have you, but our campesinos are working and they don't have the luxury of leaving work to be able to go pick up those materials. So we have been taking some of those materials to them. We actually took a survey to see what they needed what they would like, what is lacking in their home, and they shared with us what they needed, and that's what we've been purchasing. As a result of all of the generous donations from uh, fellow compañeros, family members, friends of the community. So if you can go into the Action Council website, you can please share with people so that they're aware of how to donate to this particular cause. And the other thing we just want to you know, let people know is that you can always follow we, after every caravan or every um, adopt a quadrilla that we do, photos are posted so people can see the, you know, where their donations are going to. Um, you can follow us on um, social media, um, on our Facebook page. We do have um, a link to that um, GoFundMe account. And then we also are on Instagram. And again, you know, just you know, really becoming active and in what we're doing with our our political um, privilege to be able to, you know, uh, advocate for legislation that will really, um, will really, you know, offer the what's needed, housing, mm -hmm. medical, everything that's needed. So here is our Facebook mm -hmm. and our Instagram and our mm -hmm. Gmail. I'm sure that I don't know if we went over time, but we're we're good and we're going to move quickly. Okay, so this is <laughs> thank, you. thank you, thank you, thank you, Ruby and Rosa. Um, thank amazing you. work. It reminds me that mutualistas throughout our history have been groups like this that surface to support the entire community at different points in history. So um, I'm appreciative and uh, it's really great. My birthday is on Saturday. I'm gonna be 71. I have friends that are in their 70s. We've been out there for a long time and it's great to see that all the young people, the eight year old that you mentioned, you know, uh, the, that, the progressive work goes forward, it goes on. Yes, soy cansada. But, there, but there's a lot of young people who have energy, focus, and uh, thank you for your leadership and your idealism and uh, the, the, work, the activism that you're doing that's making a great difference in the lives of campesinos in Watsonville. It makes a difference, it really does. When you're out there working so hard, uh, it, if you think that people are watching and validating what you're going through and appreciating you, it just makes the world of difference. It really does. It makes them feel like they're part of the community, um, that, that people know what they're going through. And uh, thank you so much for sharing all of this, Ruby and Rosa, and all of you who are involved in the caravan work. Uh, and great that we have the digital nest supporting you, because that's institutional support, right? Perfecto. All right, so we're going to move forward now with Gabriela. Um, it's Gabriela is reading all the way from Seattle, but a part of her always remains here. In my heart, she's my comadre, but also she is from the Watsonville community. So Gabriela Gutierrez de Mus is a professor in modern languages and women and gender studies. 
and the Theline Pickett McCone Endowed Chair in the Humanities at Seattle University. She's a polylingual poet, critic, cultural worker, and mother, and wife. She is the author editor of eight books of poetry, criticism, and culture, and multiple articles, encyclopedia entries, opinion pieces. She received her MA and PhD from Stanford University. She also authored the published and forthcoming poetry collections, Needing Words and How Many Indians Can We Be? She is the author of A Most Improbable Life, The Runaway Poems, and The Plastic Book. So thank you, Gabi, for being willing uh, to participate and join us tonight. Um, I also want to say that Gabriela was a teacher uh, with the Potter Valley Unified School District and also with Gabriel at one time. Thank you, Gabi. Are you here? Here. Oh, oh okay. I'm Wonder trying to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you very well. Thank you. Um, did you have my, uh, I'm going to try to share the screen. I sent you uh, a PowerPoint of some images. Yeah, well, that, uh, that, that, that didn't come through, but um, okay, let me we'll see if sharing the screen works because I have it on my computer. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, it, it put everything that I'm working on. <laughs> okay. Is that coming on? Share? Not yet. Well, not yet, Gabs. Maybe okay, we can I'm going to just go on. I, yeah. I, I do want to say thank you. I'm so proud of all of you. And I'm just, I can't believe this incredible work with a caravan ruby and that a principal would, would be, I wish that had happened when I was little and working in the fields that they had given us anything or even seen us. So I'm going to start with um, El Invisible, which is uh, the first two are to my uncles and this one is to my father. Gabi. Yeah. It's showing now. So. I, I can see it. Can you see it? It's showing oh, now. Yeah. The, yeah, the artwork is showing. Go ahead. Uh, let me see if it show. I, I wanted it to. Okay. So I don't know how it's gonna. Well, just just read and move it forward manually. Yeah. Okay. Got it. El invisible. <laughs> Oh, and I am reading a couple of poems in Spanish. I just thought it was important to do that. It so, is important. Thank you so much, Gabi. Mm -hmm. El Invisible. Pudo ser Santo Claus en mayo, agua de riego en verano. Pasó inapercibido como un hippie en los 70, o un loco sin casa en los Estados Unidos. Fue cocinero de Paul Newman, Lava platos de Clint Eastwood. Le limpió la caca a Mr. Jacuzzi. Sería famoso si contáramos todas las manzanas que piscó y los carros que lo dejaron en media carretera. La cantidad de pork chops que se comió, pero ni siquiera le permitieron ser ridículo o trabajador o pobre a mi padre en este país, ni tampoco Invisible. I wanted to um, uh, read from a book that was recently published and Patrice Vecchione included me in her book, My Shouting Shattered Whispering Voice, which is a great book for teachers. Um, I just sent it to Graciela Vega because it's going to be, it was just her birthday. And Shirley's birthday is on Saturday. She's going to get something else. Um, I am reading this poem that was included as a chapter. And it's to my uncles and my cousins who are still to this day. I have 173 cousins. So I still have some um, of them that work in the fields like my parents and, and I did. 
And the name of the poem is, These Are the Hands That Could Sand a Wooden Bench. When I come by to deliver my burritos de papa con huevo, they ask me, the men with silver caps on their teeth, what church are you from? Why did you come? I bring burritos y café for you. I come from no church, but my cousins are somewhere being fed by someone. So I thought I should come bring you my burritos de papa con huevo y salsa, something calientito to eat, you know. They smile, their metal smiles, as they hold my two babies and pass them around, kiss them and touch their nursed legs, hold their hands and sit one of them on the back of my station wagon so they can share the baby, like the Santo Nino de Atocha. They stare at the other one, comment on his curls, his soft skin. They laugh and encourage him as he farts on his production, encourage him to be human. Apriétele, mijo, con ganas. They know a fat baby like the one their cousin has. Pura leche, they say, proud of my Mexican breasts and compliment my salsa, help me put things away as a few of them leave. The white men who collect them see me and smirk. I must be someone's lover, they erroneously think. Stare at my huge milk breasts, not understanding that breasts mean so much more than sex but I feel protected by the Mexican men, my new friends who would do anything for my sons and me from now on because they know how to be graceful and grateful. I know my father is watching with hope. Theirs are the hands that never get lotion to put on their grietas. From the construction work, the fields, the cleaning of people's garages, the carrying buckets of God knows what, the shit they have to disappear, the taking apart of debris they did not create, but must clean. Theirs are the hands I shake when I arrive in limbo, the hands that could sand a wooden bench. The hands that become soft as they touch my babies because they imagine their children in mine, because they hold their children in deep embrace when they hold mine. This one I wrote to my father, Manzanas and Corralitos, because that's where he always picked apples. And you know, corralitos means little corral. Los árboles cantan una ranchera cuando paso por los campos en los que regaste tu agua bendita. No fuiste iglesia ni sacerdote para bendecirla. Esa tierra que nos alimentó, pero la bendijiste con tus manos. No fuiste propietario ni dueño de los árboles, pero sí fueron tuyos cada día al tocarlos. Enrollaron sus ramas en tus piernas, te acariciaron sin medida. Fueron tu padre, porque no tuviste padre. Y saciaron tu hambre, sus frutos. Te aconsejaron y te quisieron más que tus hermanos. Y los tomaste de la mano cada día, papá. Y el rocío de la mañana limpió tu angustia. Sus ramas verdes te tranquilizaron. Papa. This, um, this is another one for my father in English. Ancestral hunger. In the fields, mi papá devoraba las manzanas, los tacos de Winnie, bien dorados en la lumbre, la salchicha con huevo siempre hambriento. Su hambre era ancestral, era generacional, genética, social, biológica, cultural. Era el hombre del hambre, 
Era un hambre de padre, era el hambre justicia, era el hambre de un niño adulto pescando en el río con las manos para dar de comer a sus hermanos. Suspiraba por el hombre sexual de su hacendado padre que violaba a su madre una vez por semana frente a él. Era su hambre, el hambre de poder ser hombre sin calificativos, el hambre ancestral. So I thought it was in English, but when you speak several languages, <laughs> you think you're, uh, you're speaking English when you're speaking Spanish. So I think the title says it all. It's about the different types of hunger um, that um, my father had because of having suffered so much as a child. And um, I want to read you the one to my mother, but I can't find it. Or oh, here it is. And I wrote this one. I, thought I should have some for my mom and for my dad. So my, my dad worked in the fields always. My mother worked in the cannery and in the fields. And this is uh, called Legacy or Lullaby. And I will change the slide so you can see something else. Legacy or Lullaby. Mother, you made me out of broccoli and cauliflower, peaches and apples, strawberries and blackberries on the line. Tunas, jicamas, masa, chile pasado, esquites, frijoles at home. I became a fruit and vegetable roll up for this country to consume. Oh, how you wanted for me to eat up this world, mother. Oh, how you wanted for me to eat this world up. Oh, how I eat them every day. All of your nightmares, all your nightmares dissipate como espuma. They will soon be gone, mama. And um, do I still have a little bit of time? I, I thought I should read this, this piece, which is more um, prose, uh, but in honor of uh, Esperanza del Valle. <laughs> it yes. takes about two minutes. Oh, do I still have Yes. What? Yes, okay. yes. Okay. And I wanted to just thank all the people that have been there in Watsonville working. Shirley, who is the glue for that entire community. And I met Shirley when she was a teenager <laughs> and I was a young girl and she has impacted me and I am what I am because of her being my role model. And I just wanna say happy birthday, comadre, on Saturday. And thank you for all that you have given Watsonville. You are Watsonville. And um, I just wanna, wanna say that I'm also, very happy, I have to say this, that I'm reading with Vicky <laughs> and with Naomi and Shirley's there. How many times are there four PhD Chicanas in one event? <laughs> Unless it's a conference, it's very hard to find. So cheers to the other um, Chicana PhDs. I'm just so, um, grateful, so grateful and so impressed with, you know, this lineup. So I will read um, this because it has um, what you can do if you know how to dance el jarabe tapatio. <laughs> and at the end, it's my vision of, of um, those images that you have when you, I also was raised in Watsonville. Uh, we were migrant back and forth to Mexico, but I also grew up under the apple trees, I would say, and um, educated in Watsonville as well. And so this is um, a short story that was published in Ventana Abierta a while ago. The Eiffel Tower. The first city I visited alone was Paris. I left for France after my 17th birthday. Because of a vivid dream I had, I was certain I would remember the city, and so it was. I stepped off the very late train from Luxembourg in the Gare du Nord in Paris and spent the night there. I went out into the street 
at six in the morning to look around the buildings were familiar. I already knew from my dream how the French coffee and brioche would taste. I stayed at a youth hostel in Marais. My feet tasted every sidewalk crack in the neighborhood. The noises of the cars never interrupted me because the honking did not belong to me. I walked a lot because I didn't want to aim for the Eiffel Tower. I wanted to sneak around it, getting a bit nearer through new parts of town without opening the photo-laden tourist map forced on me by a huge Parisian. I wanted to open the souvenir on my own roundabout, nothing planned schedule. I wanted to circle like a patient dog scenting a tasty bone, knowing that an extra week or two buried in the ground gives the bone a flavor of distinctive character. I mediated on the disgust expressed by Verlaine and his friends for the newly constructed tower. So as not to disappoint myself, all at once, I peeked at its ugly sides from time to time, where a street widened. I found cafes where Berlin sat and sat in his thoughts. A week in Paris finished my money, but I still wasn't ready to meet the metallic tourist magnet. In the hostel, I talked a Mexican guy with a guitar down in the plaza in front of the Pompidou Center. I danced the Jarabe Tapatio in my green dress from Jalisco. If you're a Mexican and you need some cash, it's really worth the trouble to pull the Jarabe Tapatio from your long bag of tricks. Wherever the hell you find yourself, you'll be fine. We got enough money to each stay three more weeks in Paris, 23 francs a night, lockout during the day and moving every four days to a new hostel mattered not at all. I was in Paris and I'm skipping two paragraphs. And there I was in Ernst for the day when I finally got there. And there I was in front of this structural sorcery and the first and only picture I could form was of an orchard ladder with ladder with my father at the very top picking apples while I played marbles underneath. It's only a metal triangle of a ladder to raise what needs to be lifted up and lowering what's finished being raised. Um, thank you. I want to thank uh, Veronica. Veronica Eldridge, who made this wonderful slides for me. And um, you got to see a few of them. And I want to say to Ruby, the poem I didn't get to read is to all people, saying to them, when you eat, you are kissing us. Because most of the fruit in this country is picked by Mexicanos. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank you, Gabriela. That was beautiful. So, I uh, yes, I wanted to uh, understate that Veronica Eldridge from San Jose is the one who did the PowerPoint for the art that goes along. She is an artist, and she also has made a submission to the Pajaro Valley Gallery. So thank you, Veronica, for your contribution tonight. So our next speakers are Ruby Vasquez and Janet John. So go ahead and go. Uh, uh, Gabby, could you stop sharing your screen? Okay. Okay. I, I don't, I'm trying to mute. Stop. Uh, Janet, if you want to try sharing your screen, it may cancel out um, the okay. current screen that's yeah. being shared. Let's see if that works. Did that work? There you go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. okay. Hi, um, my name is Janet Johns, and um, and my comadre Ruby Vasquez, you've met, and she'll introduce herself as well. I I came to Watsonville. Um, 
as a brand new teacher in 1978 and, and taught in Pajaro Valley in, in Watsonville for 40 years. And, um, and also, you know, when I came as a teacher, I had already started dancing baile folklorico at, at my at San Jose State University and really um, met the artist community of Watsonville immediately um, and wanted to to work with a bunch of teachers who were interested in learning folklorico dance so that's how we started we we call our official beginning when we wrote our first arts council grant in 1980 um, as our beginning, but we really started in 1978. And Comadre Ruby, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah, I, yeah. So I started dancing as a five-year, well, six-year-old, with Florencia Chavoya. Um, if anybody has folklorico roots in Watsonville, you, you you will know that Florencia Chavoya um, came from Mexico and started a group in her patio, in her backyard. And then we, then we became incorporated as the dancers for the Penny Club. Again, if any of you know Watsonville history, you will know what the Penny Club um, did for many of us, um, many of us children here in Watsonville. But um, I started with Esperanza del Valle as a brand new teacher, um, graduated from UCSU with my, my credential and went right to the first rehearsal. That's the first thing I did is, graduated and then went, found Esperanza del Valle uh, so that I can continue to dance because um, over, through the college years, I, I stopped dancing. Um, yeah, so I've been dancing with them ever since and I am assistant um, director with Esperanza del Valle and then started a children and youth dance group, Estrellas de Esperanza. And we're probably about, maybe about 10, 11, 12 years old. I don't remember, but um, yeah. So I hope that these slides are um, come in clearly, but we are celebrating our 40th anniversary in the year 2020. We had so many plans with um, our performances at the Mellow Center in September and the Crocker Theater, which is Cabrillo College in November, and always doing our annual Dia de los Muertos events at Teatro Campesino Playhouse. And we always bring maestros from Mexico. We had three scheduled to come to offer open studios um, for the community, for dance companies like, like Ruby's Children's Dance Company, but so many others in our community with maestro from Chihuahua, Veracruz, and Colima. But instead, you know, we, we were hit with a pandemic and um, we had to take a a different approach. So we wanted to share with you um, what we are doing sheltering in home and trying to um, continue to do our work in the community. I, I forgot to mention that I'm, you know, assistant, I mean, I'm the artistic director of the company, but I can see that many of our members are um, with us tonight. And we have been so many people, I'd say hundreds of people have come in and out of Esperanza del Valle over the course of 40 years that we've been in existence. And, um, and I know we have a lot of different roots, you know, of, of many of our dancers who have started their own companies or have gone on to dance with different companies. So um, we kind of feel like the mama, you know, de la comunidad. And um, we're, our history does date back to, you know, 1980, but we're really proud to um, continue to come to promote our Mexican culture and dance as we shelter in place. And um, what we wanna do is, is share a, a series of videos that um, highlight a repertoire of our dance regions over the 40 years. We've been Zooming together um, weekly since the pandemic hit. And um, it's a little bit challenging for a dance company to continue to dance from home, but we're doing our best. and. And so we want to just show you a beautiful promo video to kick off our 40th anniversary season um, created by Ale, Alejandro Santana Jr. And let's see if this one will come in. Are you here? 
hearing sound? Probably not, right? Let me we, go We back. can hear the sound, Ruby, uh, Janet. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, I didn't know you could. Okay, I'm going to go back. I yeah, thought I good. didn't optimize. Oh, okay. <laughs> sorry about that. Always the glitch, right? Okay, here we go. Yeah, you're good. Thank you, Gabe. <laughs> And so we um, believe that the arts is essential to our own healing. And, um, and so that we feel like um, we wanted to continue to share these beautiful traditions of dance from our homes. And um, I'm gonna turn this over to um, Ruby because our work has really, our dedication has been to work with many maestros from Mexico over the past four decades. So and so yeah, sorry, go mother. Um, yeah, I mean, imagine we were we were working up to this big forty year anniversary. Um, it's not it's not easy, you know, keeping a group alive and thriving for forty years. And I have to say, not because she's here, because she's my comadre, but <laughs> Janet has done a phenomenal job of keeping the group together. Um, there have been, of course, there have been times where we thought it'd fall apart but somehow she keeps it together. And the group is um, like in all art, just like tonight, just the poetry that we're hearing, the images that we're seeing, just seeing everybody's beautiful face on the screen, it's all art. And how important that is, especially right now during this pandemic that we can't you know, forget about it because it, it does offer us those, those, those moments of like, you know, happiness and joy. And so, you know, we, we have been um, honored and we've been very blessed to have been working with maestros over the, the, over the 40 sure. years. In particular, we, we, we developed a very, very strong and deep um, relationship with maestros in, the, in Veracruz. In Veracruz, the Puerto, and also in the Huasteca region of Veracruz. And as, as it says here in 1997, we began doing research of danzas and sones. And so again, you know, the, the difference between what we just saw right now, that's a mestizo dance. You hear the instrument, you know, the instruments are European. The danza is the indigenous, you know, the indigenous da danzas where, you know, the, the, the instruments will be a drum or a flute. Um, and here we are back in 1997 where we began cultivating this relationship why? Because it was so important for us to learn, you know, where these dances are coming from, the roots of where the dances are coming from, uh, and not just, you know, be here in Watsonville and, and, and do these shows. You know, we felt like an obligation to educate ourselves and inform ourselves. So we went to the, the Huasteca. Um, we made a connection with two maestros in particular, uh, Maestro Gabriel Mendoza and Maestro Candido Navarrete, and um, Janet wrote this grant where we, where we were able to get the funding. And Janet, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that grant. Well, it was really exciting that it was the Rockefeller Bancomer, um, and we were really thrilled. Two two um, dance companies in Mexico City received the grant. Two um, dance companies in New York and one dance company in Watsonville. So we were really excited um, because that made it possible for us to actually, you know, realizar un sueño to be um, in the Huasteca during Dia de los Muertos. So we were able to um, go um, to the Huasteca um, with those funds. We took a photographer, we took our, our seamstress, our Costurera, La Señora Jauregui from Las Lomas. And I think the next picture shows her. Comadre. Is it, oh, she was in, um, 
the, right here to the right. Oh yeah, yeah, and and then um, and, and 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 it was important that we took her because she was you know replicating the outfits that are being worn during doing these danzas. Um, and Maestro Gabriel, that's pictured here, was instrumental, very instrumental to get us into remote comunidades. And the comunidades indígenas de la Huasteca, primarily of the, uh, the Huastecos and the uh, Nahuatl. And um, was that the only two um, etnia, the two groups that yes. we were with? Yes. And, 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 and um, be able to, you know, ask questions to, to find out about the roots of these dance danzas and and then also you know um be able to see what is being truly worn when the danzas are are being um executed in their communities uh, a lot of times what we see on the stage even in our performances are the outfits that have been modernized that have been stylized for the stage and we were really trying to um, go back to the, the original um, outfits that are being worn. You know, we, I don't like calling them costumes because they're really not costumes. These are, these are you know, the, out, the, the, the blouses that they wear every day. Um, and and uh, Gomanda, did you want to mention anything about? You know, the artwork is found every, it's in the blouse. Look at the blouse, look at that blusa that she's wearing. That's, that's an, es una obra de arte. That's a work of art. And so, you know, to, to be able to know where the, the, these were coming, the, the blouses were coming from, and then ultimately to just get their um, approval and permission to be able to do these danzas. Because like when we, when we went, um, you know, they were like, what do you mean you want to do these danzas? Like, you guys, like, you know, we do the danzas and like, there was, there was a lot of um, relationship building that we had to do in order to um, get permission to be able to bring the danzas and, 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 and execute them here in Watsonville. And I think that's a good point that it's building that trust with the community. We, um, once our grant money ran out, which it did within that year, um, we traveled back to the Huasteca almost every year and they were always really happy to see us. They never thought we'd come back and, and brought all of our videos and our pictures and everything to gift back to the community. And, um, and so we wanted to, well, and, and this is one of the danzas that we were there very early in the morning to see the preparation of this danza. And it's, this is a whole nother, this would take us so much longer to explain, but we wanted to lead up to our, um, our you know, I think what Ruby just dis distinguished between the indigenous danza, which is what you're seeing here with the Danza de Mujeres, and, and then also the Mestizo danza, but we are wearing the traje that these women made as we're dancing um, the, the Mestizo danzas. And, and, the theater. and, and just the, the whole remembering that, you know, um, these traditions and costumbres are, you know, century old, centuries old, and, and, they, and, and, and they are disappearing. Um, they, they are disappearing. And so we felt it was an honor and a blessing to be able to have learned what we learned and bring them here. And here during this time of the pandemic, here we are, are we're all in our houses. You know, how do we continue to, you know, call upon that energy and how to call upon that beauty of, of, the, of, these, of these dances. And so um, one of the um, dances that we learned, the dance, dance, the baile mestizo, um, as what you see here um, is called El, Quele, El Quereque, and it's a very popular song, po popular song in Mexico, and it's one of the songs that we chose to do for our shelter in place. And Comadre, do you want to talk sure. about that part? Yeah, this um, Alejandro um, Santana, who's right in the middle, right there on the screen, is our 
wonderful Esperanza del Valle dancer, but with the digital nest and an amazing, um, you know, talent when it comes to technical videos and, and his support. So we, um, I would choreograph, you know, we all had our little tarimas or whatever we had in our homes, right? And um, so I choreographed the piece, like what the women would be doing, what the men would be doing, and, and then all of our dancers recorded themselves and sent the videos to Alejandro, who put them together into these collage videos that um, we started, you know, right at the beginning of the pandemic, and we've been creating, you know, a number of them throughout these months. So we wanted to share Kerreke with you. Another member of Esperanza del Valle. So, um, how are we on time, Shirley? We have one more video, but we can skip it. Um, let's see, it's eight o'clock. We have one more poet, and then uh, a couple of people were going to talk about their art. So, I, how long is it, Janet? It's probably another two minutes. Oh, we're good. Go for it. Okay, this is, um, I also want to mention um, Jalisco, um, because the maestro Ramon Morones, this is his work, his, his dances, and he was very instrumental with Esperanza del Valle. <laughs>
And thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to get, let you follow us on Facebook to keep uh, in touch with our, the work of Esperanza del Valle. Thank you for inviting us to be a part of this special event. Yeah, Shirley, thank you so much for allowing Thanks. space for the thank dance. You. The Both music. of you. Both of you. Um, I have to also uh, make an addition because, uh, you know, anyway, I just want to say Consuelo Alba uh, has been working for a very long time in Watsonville on the Watsonville Film Festival. And the Watsonville Film Festival actually introduced the Campesino Show. We had a whole pageant of films that she brought to Watsonville, including, um, uh, what's the film with um, uh, uh, the, the Rio Grande film about our Norte? Um, what was the name of it? Oh, you guys remember. Gabe, what was the film that we showed? Consuelo, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. What was it? What was the film that we showed, the first one, uh, nor, the, but the music? Um, oh, uh, Best of Me. It's a, it's a music video with amazing uh, portraits of braceros. So okay. That's one of the inspirations for the show, yes. Well, I was thinking about the other one uh, that was made by a very famous filmmaker 30 years ago. Oh, the Chulas Monteras? Oh, Chulas Fronteras. I'm sorry, yeah. We introduced the whole, this whole Campesino show was introduced with Chulas Fronteras, which is a beautiful film. We have it in the library so you can see it. But I have to say that uh, we are so fortunate today because Consuelo is leading the charge for art in Watsonville with the uh, film festival. And uh, she's been doing this for years and years. And I am so excited that we coordinated with the Pajaro Valley Gallery and the Watsonville Film Festival this year. And uh, that's how it should be. Uh, it sh we should be an umbrella. The Pajaro Valley Gallery can be an umbrella for a variety of forms of art. Don't you agree? Exactly. You. you know, <laughs> when we uh, were considering these films, we realized that we had to work together to really celebrate the artists that we have in Watsonville, to connect all the dots, to honor the farm workers, to bring these conversations to the front and center about recognizing and the members of our community. This was even before the pandemic. As you said, we were not oh, yeah. planning to do this show and the, and the What's Milk Film Festival. Uh, mm -hmm. We had to cancel everything. I'm so pleased to see that um, we continue despite all the, the challenges. But the most important thing for us back then was to make the campesinos visible. And it's amazing how everything worked out in this way that it's bringing, it continues to bring everybody together. And that's the most important thing that we, we continue. This is, uh, you know, a great opportunity for the first time we are collaborating with the Pajaro Valley Arts Gallery. And it has been really exciting and, and it's just the first step. Uh, as Gabe said, we had so many submissions, so many local artists wanted to participate with the gallery to show their work in the community. And um, I know there is going to be more coming. So I'm very excited to be part of this program. And please watch the films that inspired um, this collaboration. It's the film Represent featuring the artist Arlene Correa Valencia. It just won an Emmy. It's a fabulous film about these artists working in Napa and really bringing the, the, the stories of farm workers to the galleries in San Francisco, in Napa Valley. It's super important uh, film and story too. And the film Best of Me with um, the, the portraits of Brasteros that we can see at the virtual uh, tour still available on the PVA website. So the films can be seen at the Watsonville Film Festival. We have a page dedicated to virtual films. You can go there and the virtual exhibit as is at the Pajaro Valley Arts Gallery. Okay. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you. All right, Consuelo. All right, so we are going to continue with uh, Victoria Vanales. Uh, Victoria uh, earned her PhD in literature and feminist studies from the University of California, Santa Cruz. She is a bilingual Chicanx mother, teacher, activist, and writer. Her work 
has appeared in the following anthologies and journals, Beyond the Frame, Women of Color and Visual Representations, Translocalities, Trans um, Localidades, Feminist Politics of Translation in the Latin Latina Americas, uh, Porter Gulch Review and North Dakota Quarterly. She is currently writing her first novel titled Candelaria. She teaches English at Cabrillo College and resides in Watsonville with her husband, son, and four huge cats. Victoria? Thank you, Shirley. And um, I, I feel so honored to be part of the Watsonville community. Um, just watching, you know, everything that we were being given today, um, the Watsonville Campesino Appreciation Caravan, the Watsonville Film Festival, the Digital Nest, Pajaro Valley Arts Council, Esperanza del Valle. I mean, I'm just like, wow, I live here. I live in Watsonville. So I, I'm so honored to be a part of this community and also honored to be invited to read some poems. And thank you, um, Noemi and Gabriela. Wow. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna read two poems. Um, one's in English and one is in Spanish. And in these poems, I, I take jabs at our politicians in Watsonville, in Watsonville, excuse me, in Washington. No, not Watsonville, in Washington. Um, you know, all the anti-immigrant rhetoric. Um, and so, yeah, I'll start with the first one. It's called The Devil's Fruit. Okay. Fat cats in MAGA hats gather around DC. 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. In fine, elegant attire, they arrive, dressed to kill, dressed to impress. They grin, they gripe, ready to dine, ready to fight. Fat cats in MAGA hats eat fresh green salad. Farm workers plant romaine, iceberg, and red leaf lettuce. Fat cats in MAGA hats sip fine sparkling wine. Farm workers harvest Cabernet, Chardonnay, and Merlot grapes. Fat cats in MAGA hats lick cool strawberry sorbet. Farm workers pick the prickly red fruit, la fruta del diablo, as the farm workers say. But the devil's fruit is in the fat cats. We'll end DACA, they shout. We'll cut asylum, they toast. We'll halt H-1B visas, they cheer. We'll close the border, they rejoice. We'll call them rapists. They snarl. We'll throw them in cages. They sneer. We'll build a wall. They howl. We'll wave a Bible. They preach. Their fiery eyes roll back in ecstasy, burning. Their foamy mouths sprout fangs, threatening. Their deadly hands release sharp claws, menacing ready to burn, eviscerate, and maim, ready to swim in a sea of red, ready to make America great again. Fat cats in MAGA hats, hiss, growl, expand, grow big, metamorphose, turn into poisonous toads with horns, and the hats go pop right off their horned heads. Fat toads look dazed and confused, not really knowing what to do. Tuckered and gassed, they don't feel so fine anymore. Their bodies secrete something toxic, it seems. They cough, they gag, their stomachs turn. The salad, the wine, the pink sorbet, the bile. Into the red hat it all goes. La fruta del diablo, Montezuma's revenge. Fat toads look tuckered and gassed. They don't feel so fine anymore. They rub their lumpy horns, massage their engorged bellies, look desperate and wild, dazed and confused, not really knowing what to do. Fat toads with soggy red hats gather around DC, 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue Northwest. 
but they don't feel so fine anymore. Like old Mr. Toad, they frantically race home, past Black Lives Matter Plaza, past the protesters, past the Supreme Court, past the MLK Memorial. Fat toads don't feel so fine anymore. They careen, they sway, and back to the putrid swamp they go. So that's my first poem. <laughs> Um, that's how I deal with my anger these days, by writing poems. So my next poem is in Spanish, and it's uh, called Poema para, para Stephen Miller. And if you know who Stephen Miller is, um, I told my mom I was going to read a poem for Stephen Miller, and my mom's like, ¿Para qué le escribes un poema ese viejo? <laughs> so he's uh, one of Donald Trump's senior advisors, and He's been responsible for a lot of the anti-immigration legislation. He wrote the speech for Donald Trump when he um, inaugurated himself to the presidency, you know, that first speech where he called Mexicans rapists. And so he's really awful. He's like behind like caging families and children. And so anyways, I wrote this poem to Stephen Miller. It's in Spanish. I apologize for those of you who don't understand Spanish. Um, maybe I'll translate it someday. Okay, poema para Stephen Miller. ¿Quién trabajó de sol a sol para darte de comer? ¿Quién cosechó esa sandía que desayunaste con tu café? Hombre ingrato pelón que asustas al amanecer, pareces un gusano y aún así te crees. ¿Quién se agachó y dobló la espalda para que no faltara la lechuga? En tu supermercado, en el restaurante y en la ensalada de ayer. ¿Quién estiró los brazos alcanzando el durazno, la manzana y la pera? ¡Ah, qué rico está tu postre relleno de cereza! ¿A quién le debes tu desayuno, almuerzo y cena? ¿A quién ignoras o te haces el ignorante mientras comes una fresa? ¿A quién miras y a quién rechazas cuando escaneas los campos? ¿Acaso no miras mujeres, hombres y niños agachados como arcos? ¿Tan grande es tu ceguedad que no los puedes ver? El campo es amplio, pero más grande es tu desdén. Sé que existe la justicia y algún día vas a ver cómo envejecerás. Y entonces dime tú, ¿quién te dará de comer? ¿Quién te atenderá cuando tu cuerpo esté huesudo, con artritis y achaques y te bañen al desnudo? ¡Ay! No quiero ni pensarlo. Se me sale el desayuno. Recuerda lo que te digo, que nadie es inmortal. El odio y el racismo algún día te sacudirán. Y tú quedarás como alma que pena penando, como un gusano arrugado, arrastrando tus cadenas, exiliado del jardín, sin tu copa de aladín sin tus uvas, ni aguacate, ni toronjas, ni jitomate. Recuerda lo que te digo, que nadie es inmortal. Tu legado dejarás y muy solo te quedarás. Nosotros los latinos, aquí seguiremos. Y al final ya verás que de nosotros dependerás. Pero a donde tú vas, no nos encontrarás. Que te vaya bien, Stephen Miller, que algún día morirás. Y al final ya verás que en el infierno bailarás. Thank you, everybody. That was amazing. And um, I have to underscore what you said. Uh, what an amazing community we live in, right? All the talent here, all the innovation, all the creativity, and most of all, all of the response. Intelligent response, loving response, giving response in poetry, in film, in food, in caravans, in dance. We are so fortunate because we have something inside of us and we have something to draw from. It comes from our history, it comes from our culture, it comes from our family, it comes from our community, and it didn't just start today. It's been with us through our antepasados, our grandparents and our great grandparents, and it traverses both sides of the border. And we are so fortunate, very, very rich. Thank you so much for being here, everyone. So now we're gonna continue and have a little bit of discussion on the art. Um, uh, Jessica, 
would like to talk a little bit about her pieces and Gabe will talk about his pieces as well. And I don't know if Lucien wants to make a comment. Nod yes or no, Lucien. No? Yes or no? No, she's thinking about it. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So um, both the Gabe, how are you? How are you? Uh, Gabe, go ahead. Yeah, for sure. And um, if you could pull up those slides, Shirley, that you were showing earlier, that way we could reference um, some of those images. That would be awesome. Okay. All right. And then Jessica, you want to go ahead and um, introduce yourself first? All right. I'm going to spotlight you. Here you go. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jessica Carrasco, and I'm one of the local artists that has one of her pieces um, for the Campesino show. Um, my piece is titled uh, Wings Cut, and I don't know if Gabe can put it up on the screen so you guys can take a look at it. Um, but it was inspired by a quote by a writer from the Salinas Valley, and his name was, um, his name is Damian Leon. Um, and the quote um, reads, immigrant parents with their wings cut still teach their children to fly. And when I heard this quote, I really wanted to create a piece that acknowledges and recognizes hard labor um, that campesino, campesinos endured just because of, you know, growing up here, that's, that's what I grew up seeing. And I, and I feel like um, not so often we, you know, we recognize them and we um, honor them and, you know, for everything that they're doing. And I specifically wanted to do a piece that focused on las mujeres um, que andan en el campo and las mamás and everything that um, the mother campesinas endure for their children and how they give everything to their children, including hope. Um, and when I was creating this piece, I had I had become a mother for the first time. So I had a lot of, uh, I had mothers in mind while creating this and everything that mothers go through for their children, all the work that they, um, that they do that are that is also not acknowledged or recognized and all the labor that they endure physically mentally and spiritually and this piece was for them to say thank you and that I see your work awesome thanks Jess and um, if you uh, okay, <laughs> here's um, one of my pieces right here. This is um, called Hombre de Maíz. And um, the inspiration for this one, and actually the next one, Shirley, if you could click on that one, Mujer de Maíz, which is my absolute favorite one um, that I submitted. And I have two more pieces that I'll talk about. Um, but these were really inspired by, um, I um, dance with um, Ishkatuli or um, White Hawk here in Watsonville. And we have a ceremony every year, minus this year, because of you know the current situation that we're in, called Shilonin. And that's where we celebrate, um, it's a celebration of the young women um, um, who are coming in um, to become Shilonin and protecting our younger um, girls and kids in our circle. And um, this was inspired by that. Um, we have this one dance um, that is really powerful. It's called Maiz. And the dance is all about going through the different phases of um, planting the maize, cultivating the maize, and sharing the maize with the community. So that's where um, this piece was inspired. And um, I was inspired so much by it that I had to get it tattooed on me. So this is on my left arm right here um, because it was just a beautiful piece that I really connected with. And um, one of my other pieces, I think Shirley's sc scrolling through it right now, um, it is called um, Campesino Tree. And let's see, let's see, keep going, Shirley. Uh, uh, where are we up at? or down? Uh, go down. It's the one with the tree. Let's see. Let's see. A little bit more down. Oh, right there. Number. Oh, you just passed it. Scroll down. Down, down, down. Uh, number 30. Okay. Yeah. There you go. Um, so this one's called Campesino Tree. Um, it was on canvas. And the inspiration for this one was actually my abuelita, as I was talking about earlier. Every day that um, she'd wake up at four in the morning, cook breakfast for everybody, have that prepped and ready, leave the house by five, go out to the field, and then she'd return back home. And every time she came back home, we have this tree where she would take off her boots, her sweater, put her bucket right there, her hat. And um, I remember just seeing that imagery growing up. And um, 
that tree reminds me of my grandma. So I wanted to try capturing that. So um, if you noticed on this painting, I have boots hanging, um, you know, from the branches and it's carrying their lunch pail. Also the bucket that you, she used to pick with. Um, I remember that hanging from the tree as well. So um, I was really trying to channel my inner abuelita when I was painting this one. And um, another one, um, because of her boots, I always just remember her boots. Um, and she had so many pairs of boots um, throughout the household. And um, if you scroll up again, Shirley, um, I did another piece called um, Botas de Fresas. And um, that one was really meant to um, really capture the magical realist um, perspective, which is what I really love doing with my paintings. Um, I love magical realism, um, you know, from Marquez, um, 100 Years of Solitude, to um, Isabel Allende's House of Spirits, and um, even, you know, Toni Morrison's Beloved is a magical realist book. And I really try channeling that um, because one, I just love how we see the magic in our culture a lot of the times. And I really tried capturing that within my images. So um, this one right here was a piece that I created again, inspired by my grandma's boots um, that she used to pick. And um, this person is the, vein, um, the vines and the strawberries, right? So those are her pants right there. And, um, and this was my first time getting into a gallery. I don't know if it was your first time too, Jessica, but um, it was really awesome to see our work be highlighted here in our community. We have, um, you know, just as Vicky was saying, we have so much talent here from artists to dancers to, um, you know, even in politics too, we're getting very creative. So, um, you know, when, when Consuelo approached me about the, the gallery, I was like, "Woo, girl, I got so many ideas, let's do it. <laughs> so um, these were a, a few of the pieces that I submitted. And um, there was also a digital piece too um, called um, Ojos de Campesino. It's not digitized right now, but um, in, in the slideshow, but really, uh, if you scroll up again, um, Shirley, uh, it's going to be, let's see, keep going. Um, and with that piece, um, what I was really trying to capture was um, the eyes. I remember visiting my grandma one time out in the fields and um, I just saw her eyes and I could just see how tired she was. And, um, and I was really trying to capture that. Yeah, this one's still, but their eyes were blinking and you could see the gloss in it. So um, this was me trying to work with animation and just really capture looking at a campesino and seeing what they're going through and seeing the story behind their eyes. Um, so those were the few pieces that I created. And, you know, it was just amazing to see it alongside all these other artists that we had um, locally um, from right here in Watsonville. Thank you, Gabe. Yeah, thank you, Shirley. Lucien, us a, do you want to say something? Prepared. Um, thank you so much for um, including my artwork in this wonderful exhibit. Um, I just, uh, it may, I was able to um, research about the, uh, the, I'm Japanese Americans and my, um, my ancestors did work in the fields also. And um, I, um, for this one, um, Sandy Leiden had a book as well as um, Kazuko Nakane had a book and I researched about the Japanese American community um, in Watsonville um, about the discrimination they faced with the anti-alien land laws but also the contributions that um, in strawberries and sugar beets and in other um, um, agriculture until they were um, then in 1945 um, um, went to concentration camps because of World War II, and then the Bracero program started. So we have a lot in common, and um, I'm really appreciative that we have, we were able to share our histories. This one is about uh, Filipino farm workers um, in Watsonville, but also um, showing their contribution to the um, Great Strike in the 1960s, and, um, but also, they, they also did face the um, Watsonville uh, riots where um, they were um, dragged from their homes and beat up. Um, and I think it's really important to see um, our common histories, um, but also our contributions, um, because they, they, can, they contribute a lot 
in, in agriculture. Okay, and then for the Chinese too, um, um, they um, were in the late 1900s and came to Watsonville and um, worked in the fields. Um, but again, the, um, working, the Working's Man Party, you know, had this fierce you know, anti-Chinese legislation. Um, but again, I wanted to show their contributions, um, but also how many um, people of color, how um, we, have, we do have a lot in common in terms of working in the fields. And um, when I saw this wonderful program, you know, I, I, it just brings me so much joy to see the, the culture and the, the dancing and the support the community gives to its people. And um, so thank you very much for- um, Thank you, Lucian. Thank you for thank your you. comments. Gracie, did you want to say something or not? Um, sure, I can speak on the piece. Um, so this, hi, thank you, Lucian. Thank you all the artists who have come before me. Um, and thank you for the Pajar Valley Arts Council and the organizers for bringing this show to light. Um, so, this piece, I um, I put it because there has been so much organization and activist work even within the campesinos um, from the Filipino workers to um, Cesar Chavez and, and my uncle who was organizing, you know, with, with the campesinos. Um, and then all of the people from Watsonville that attend Cesar Chavez's funeral and the work that continues to be done with Dolores Huerta and all the work that happens. But um, I was viewing the strawberries as love, you know. Um, Gabriela mentioned the kissing that when you, she was gonna read that poem, um, that, a po that a strawberry is like a kiss. And so it's like the heart because you're putting your heart into it. Um, so I was picturing Watsonville and all the, the work that we'll put in there. Um, and, and this child uh, there in the middle that represents like joy and um, the, the next generation, the future, uh, giving us their heart, you know, working as a school teacher. I see the joy and the wonderful ideas that students have. So. And I myself was a student that worked in the field. So, anywho, uh, the next piece is um, honoring mothers. There was another image I had submitted, and um, it was my mother I had painted. She had saved money, she worked two jobs, um, and she had a Chevy Nova, well, which is a muscle car. And she um, worked uh, two different jobs. And she was able to save money, you know, and so for a, for a Mexican woman to have a Chevy Nova in 1984 was, you know, was as something to be admirable. So I, I admired my mom for having a, a muscle car then, which she later passed on to me. But here is a, a mother and, and daughter. And when we hear um, Esperanza del Valle talking about reclaiming the culture, I wanted to feature these two women who were uh, are, are reclaiming the, the culture, you know, by, by the woman showing her rebozo and then the other two women having embroidery work and also the artesan work with the papel picado in the backdrop and the difference, you know, the multiculturalness, the mestizo. So she has very curly Chino hair and then her daughter has very straight hair. So um, anywho. Thank you for letting me be part of the Pajo Valley Arts Council, um, being a member and, and participating in the show. So thank you so much. And thanks, Gracie. And the continued work of the board. So um, it's been a long struggle. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Zip. Thank you so I much. Am, um, thank you, Gracie. I am going to uh, run through the slides, uh, all of them, so you have a chance to see them. And then we'll take a time uh, for conversation or questions if you'd like to stay and do that. So this should take five minutes.
Awesome. And just one quick announcement. Um, as uh, Consuelo mentioned earlier, um, that little gap of time that we had, um, we got to go into the gallery and document a video of uh, three people going in and experiencing the art gallery. Um, so that is going to get um, right now. Ooh. Oh my gosh, what happened back there? Okay, so that's gonna get edited and we should have that out within the next, um, I wanna say within the next two weeks, if not sooner. Um, and just check out the Pajaro Valley Arts Gallery and then we'll go ahead and post that on our social media sites. Um, that way everybody could access that. Uh, did you have something else to show tonight, Gabe? No, that was it. I, I wanted to show some clips, but um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a perfectionist and I, I don't wanna just show my sloppy workspace quite yet. <laughs> That's fine because there's 60 people here and you've already um, directed them to go to the website. Uh, when will we be able to see that? So that is in the process of being edited right now. So it should be coming out within, um, within the next two weeks. Um, so I'm still say, editing August, it. Yeah. August 15th? Around August there. 15th. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, it will be in both English and Spanish. Okay. That's good. And if people have comments, please make your comments. Yeah, feel free to um, unmute yourselves and uh, yeah. have a discussion with us. Will there be um, on the website of the gallery, these the, the images that are on the wall with the artist's names? So if you go to the Pajaro Valley Art um, website, you could check out the virtual tour. And in the virtual tour, it um, guides you and it actually has a lot of the information from the artist, their pieces, what inspired them in a quick little blurb. And I'll go ahead and link that in the comments right now. Hi, I just want to thank you for everything that you've put together tonight and just uh, also give kudos to that virtual tour. This is Jennifer Colby. I use the virtual tour with my CSUMB students and I was just amazed at what they got out of it. They were really able to, uh, in the COVID situation, um, explore a gallery, which otherwise they wouldn't have been able to do and write about uh, the pieces there. So I really want to thank you um, so much. Uh, for, for the teachers out there, um, I will tell you that we have uh, the Education Committee. Um, Linda, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Uh, tell us the name of the person who developed the curriculum. Karen Lemon. Karen Lemon has developed a curriculum on four of these artists. Each, four, each artist has a uh, paintings, but there's a whole curriculum about uh, interviews with them, biographies of them, the artwork themselves, questions directing your students to think about the art in different ways. So please um, refer that information on to the teachers in the Barrow Valley Unified School District and at Cabrillo because this will be on our website also. It's now on the website, Shirley. Okay. So, and it's grades six through 12. It's, all, it's, it's, it's an amazing piece of uh, curriculum development that she has done. It's all there for you as a teacher. All you have to do is go to the website and push play. Is the curriculum by any chance available in Spanish as well? Yes, it is. Thank you. And, you know, as we as we wrap up, I just encourage people, you know, during this time, um, even if you don't consider yourself an artist, go out there, pick up a pencil, sketch, paint, 
um, it, it's not only a therapeutic, but it really um, develops your uh, critical and creative skills, um, which we could all, you know, definitely use. So um, I urge you guys pick up, uh, you know, some paper, pens, or do whatever it is that really feeds your soul. Like for many of us artists, this is what really um, connects us us to our community and um you know and it really um is therapeutic for many of us so even um with poetry too like i think i'm gonna write some poetry as soon as we're done with this because i'm um, hearing these powerful mujeres just talk and arrange these words in such an amazing way was really inspiring so um we want to thank every one of you for attending today coming on board um we know these are crazy times but um when we could gather together and share art, it feeds the soul. And um, we thank every um, one of you for being here today. So thank you, please be safe and um, enjoy uh, your weekend, <laughs> um, whatever that looks like. Thank you for being here. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, um, I, took, I took my grandkids up to Mount Madonna and we went the back way through Hecker Pass, or not Hecker Pass, yeah, uh, uh, Green Valley Road, and then you turn right on Hecker Pass, right? And you go all through the mountain range there. Um, what a beautiful area we live in, you know? It, there's a lot of beauty, and it's captured by these artists, workers working, and, um, you know, it's beautiful, really, everything that we're looking at. There's a, they capture the humanity of our lives and our work. So important, don't you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Be Beto, Beto Elridge is here and so is Rosa. Shirley, I don't know if they want to say something about their work. Um, Beto, did you want to say something? Beto, Veronica. Elridge. Veronica, oh. she's not are you still here. Yeah, I, I'm still here. Okay, did you want to make a comment? I can make a super quick comment. I okay. know we're closing out. Um, so the the two pieces that I have that are part of the exhibit are um, actually for a children's book that Gabriela Gutierrez Simus wrote. Um, it's not published yet, but I was really happy that these two pieces were uh, able to be part of this exhibit um, just because it's it's so important um, to me to be able to share this work with the community um, and I'm really honored also to to be a part of this exhibit um, so thank you so much And Don, Don, Rosa Hernandez is here. I know you spoke earlier, but it would be good to hear your words. Um, which one, is, Rosa, which one is yours, dear? There's she has three of, three, yeah, there's okay. three pieces, Shirley, but I don't see them on the screen right now. Oh, you didn't there, see any tonight? We didn't, I, yeah, they're no, there. No, I, I did see them. I oh, did just, see them on the, but no, uh, what, just saying, right there, right there, right there. Right there, okay, You're, which one? The graduate, you do see the graduate right there, uh, uh -huh. okay. and the two pieces after her. Okay. So that particular piece is inspired the same as Jessica, that particular quote about, you know, immigrants and um, parents, you know, providing wings to their children to fly. And that's what really inspired me. That actual um, graduation cap was the graduation cap that um, my my son's girlfriend wore when she graduated from UC UCSC and I was just so inspired by that quote and um, thinking about how many of us have gone to school and are first generation you know college students um, from immigrant families so I just have a desire to draw something depicting that and that's what resulted from that particular in that particular image the next one after that um, just speaks to the inequities and in, of you know in our communities. It is so expensive to live in these areas, and we have so many individuals that cannot live in a home in a single family home. It needs to be shared by two, three, sometimes four families because it is um, there's such inequities in terms of pay and um, the cost of living in certain areas, in particular here where we're at. So that's what that's what inspired me for this particular image. 
you know, speaking about, you know, the new track housing and that's what I named the street, Casas Nuevas Way in 831 and all of the families that live in that house. Um, the next one is an image of, you know, when I would take my daughter um, to school, I would see um, the food bank and the people that would line up. I mean, a long line to go and get food. And sometimes it's the individuals that pick the organic fruits and vegetables that are unable to purchase the fruits and vegetables because they're so expensive and are the ones that are needing to get that support from food banks. So that's really what that image is depicting. Um, and that's what inspired me to, to, to draw that one. Thanks for allowing me to speak. And thanks Thank for the opportunity to be part of the, this particular, um, you know, gallery um, event. Gabe talked to Jessica about the fact that this was their first time to submit their art and it was mine as well. So having to experience it this way is very different, but I am so honored to have been included and I just want to say thank you for that to all, all right. of you. Thank you. And is there anyone else out there that would want to talk about their work? And I'm going to stop the show. I'm going to stop the slideshow. Okay. Um, thank you. So I also, I just wanted to share that um, I didn't read from this book because it was written by other people, right? And you can't do that if you're taping. But I ordered a book called Estamos Aquí Poems by Migrant Farm Workers. So I would really recommend that um, at some point, uh, maybe when we're not taping, we could also read from these poems that are written by farm workers, right? About their own work experiences, travel experiences, family, immigration experiences. I, I'm enjoying the poetry very much, but I, I wanted to let you know that it is out there and available to you. Um, so are there any questions or comments? Surely I would just like to very briefly say how much I appreciate your vision for creating this event. You started talking about it a while ago and then we had the shutdown and you just, you kept at it, you trained, you learned how to make it come alive and I think it's been a fabulous event. Thanks, Linda. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, you all don't know this, but we had a, I had organized a history panel of six speakers to talk about the Bracero program, Chinese workers in the valley, Japanese workers in the valley, Croatian workers in the valley. And uh, we had a whole afternoon scheduled. We probably were going to have at least 125 participants and we had to cancel that. Uh, the other thing was we were going to read Frank Bardicke's book, um, Tramplin' in the Vintage, at the library, and had 35 people volunteered to read one chapter each, and we were going to do a book share on that. I had to cancel that, too. So um, I was scared. I'm still scared. I'm, I don't go out of my house. So I was scared to, to step forward and do anything. And then when I found out that they opened the gallery for four days and then they closed it, and that no one was ever going to see this stuff. I said, okay, okay, we're in Zoom world now, all right? So get that, get that real clear. For the next year, you're in Zoom world. So forget about organizing any other way. If you're going to do it, you're going to do it on Zoom, and you got to go forward. So that's what I decided to do. <laughs> go forward, everybody. Let's go forward. <laughs> exactly. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Linda. Yeah, and thank you for doing this. I uh, This is my second Zoom meeting in a row, and it, I often find it hard to be in, be in them for very long. But the material here, the poetry, the art, what artists had to say about the art, you know, I, I couldn't walk away from it. So, um, and I want to just make people aware. Um, my name is Len Vie. I have a program on uh, KSQD, which is community radio out of Santa Cruz. And um, some of the participants in the show have agreed to come on a program. I don't, we haven't confirmed a date yet, but it'll be next Wednesday or, you know, somewhere down the road soon within the next month, I think. Um, so um, I encourage you if you're able to pick us up on the air or you can listen to us on ksqd.org to come and listen to uh, maybe some more poetry 
uh, maybe some more of the artists commenting on their work um, because this is tremendous work. I mean, the quality of the art and the quality of the poetry is as good as you'd find, you know, in Cut off? <laughs> yeah, his screen froze, that's fine. He just needed to end it right there anyway, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, okay. and if I could add one more thing too. Um, so um, me and my uh, really good friend, Abigail Gonzalez, we have a podcast called Voices of the Ville and we're introducing a new segment called Artist of the Ville. And we have um, four artists that we interviewed already. Um, and um, I'm editing those together. I, I swear, I just pile more projects on top of my plate all the time. And um, so we're gonna be launching that hopefully um, early, let's see, um, at the end of August. Um, people like uh, Carlos Campos, who was actually featured in this gallery with this photography, Gabriela Bravo, who's a local songwriter and singer here. Um, I also got in contact um, with Luis, who's a break dancer here. And if any of you artists are interested, I'm gonna go ahead and put in our um, email address um, in the chat. And if you wanna come and hop on the mic and talk about why you got into the arts, we'd love to hear you and we wanna project as many artist voices as we can so i'll go ahead and do that and um thank you guys yeah and what what will you do with that work Gabe? Eh? so that it's a podcast so um those get uploaded up to facebook um and on um on the podcast channel on apple spotify and you could just listen to those as you're driving around you know chilling in your house cleaning up and we just have some really fruitful discussions with people within the watsonville area um, because the goal of the podcast was to highlight um, voices of the ville right watsonville voices so um it's a really uh, cool show i know jessica i'm gonna get you back on the mic because we got a lot to talk about and uh um, it's really cool. And um, yeah, and you know, if you're wanting to get into podcasting too, shoot me an email and I'm happy to coordinate any of that with you as well. Yeah, another question, Gabe, is uh, if you notice the dancers, is there a way to bring that visual in more clear? Uh, bring the dancers in? Yeah, more clear. I, I Did believe. you see they were a little blurry? Oh, for um, the videos that were being played? Yes, yes. They're gonna, um, they're gonna do that because of the internet people's okay. bandwidth yeah that happens things get that pixelated happens. depending on your internet access okay. and a lot of us have our video feed on so that takes up a lot of bandwidth so right. things get a little choppy okay other comments or questions i have one to shirley yes can you hear me this i do not it. yes thank you thank you from our deepest hearts you modeled what we each have in, in each one of us wanting to share and give that that love, you that cariño and that love, that compassion. You model it for us. Thank you, dear. Made it possible. Mi vecina. Mi vecina. 